All right, everybody, welcome back. We are doing Harmony Unleashed live today with Danny Jonacucci, award-winning trumpet player, composer, arranger, orchestrator, band leader, old friend of mine. We used to go to get sushi together all the time in lower Manhattan East Side at a great place called Oyama. Danny Jonacucci, it is awesome to have you here, bro. How are you today, my friend? Good, Stephen. I'm I'm so thrilled to be here. I that's so funny. You mentioned the old uh, grabbing sushi days when we would just sit and we would talk about big band stuff, and here we are. We're still addicts. We're still doing it um, after all these years. So that's great. Thanks for having me, dude. Absolutely, my pleasure. Yeah, you know what's funny is that I actually forgot that we used to talk about big band stuff at Oyama, just saying to each other how awesome it would be to start a big band one day, and what that would look like, and. Um, why don't we start our conversation there, man? I'll, I'll just I'll just say, you know, for anybody listening right now, Danny is like one of the baddest composers, arrangers, orchestrators out there right now. The way that he writes vocal big band charts is is really like unmatched. And I, my first impression of Danny Jonacucci was on a live gig in Philly at, in, at Chris's Jazz Club with his sextet, right? Sextet or septet? I think it was a yeah, sextet, yeah. right? With yeah. Danny Janklo and Tall Stuhl and Jamie Eblen, and I forget who was on bass, but uh, it was a it was a great band. I just remember listening to the voicings Danny was writing and being like, damn, this guy's serious. He knows what he's up to. <laughs> and and uh, and so, man, I'm really excited to hear what you what you have to say um, today during during our chat. But yeah, why don't we why don't we talk like transition from trumpet player to arranger, composer, orchestrator, and then we'll we'll meander our way into the band and how we started the band. Um, and uh and 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 attack and attack it like that yeah sounds good sounds good well cool. yeah actually i think we actually met before then believe it or not i think we had met in la when you came out with jamie jamie eblin on drums when you both were at um nyu together and you came out and you actually played with my big band i think we were both like 18 or 19 years old if i if i'm remembering this correctly the bugaboo big band that's right. That's right. We played at Catalina Jazz Club in uh, in L.A. And with I was Scotty completely... Barnard with Scotty Barnard, that's lead right. trumpet player extraordinaire. That's 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 right. Uh, Count Basie uh, orchestra director Scotty Barnhart. Yep. And uh, we did a show together. But I remember being also just blown away by your musicianship and your writing. And I remember at that very first thing we were we were already on a big band thing. We, we knew we had, uh, you know, like the <laughs> the cheese was in front of us and we were we were. <laughs> We were ready to uh, chase it. I know people know people. You find your people out there, and Danny is uh, one of the big band people. So here we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, yeah. I you've been like a big band leader for for a while. So, what made you want to start a big band? What made you be crazy enough to want to start a big band? Right. I think crazy is the key word. As we all know, it takes a certain type of person to want to do this. Um, a lot of people do it for many reasons. I think for for naturally people that write music leading a big band is, is the best way to get your stuff played. Um, obviously writing music is, is awesome. And we have such great notation programs to hear things back. We have uh, MIDI, we have great sample libraries, but there's nothing that comes close to hearing uh, your music played live. So I think that that was a really big part of it for me uh, was to hear my music played and also just to create a community. You know, a lot of the times you just meet so many like-minded people and you wanna just put them in the same room together and make music. And with big band, it's it's challenging because, well, first of all, you have to find venues that can fit a big band and pay, of course. But uh, but the the reward is so much greater because you've created something that truly you can think about uh, between us, like how many people we've met on big band gigs and how many people, great friendships and great artistic collaborations we've met just from playing in a band when you're with 16 other people that are into the same thing as you. Um, that was always a really, really big part of it for me that I wanted to pursue. Was the Bugaboo Big Band the first big band you started? Yeah, I think I started that when I was 18. I was home uh, kind of bored in, in the summers between college, going to Temple University. And in those summers off, I just said, I got to do something music related. And so I started hitting up everyone I knew in the Los Angeles area that was around our age group and, and anyone that was interested to just play some charts. And then we started booking some gigs and do some shows and, you know, made a little like a demo CD to pitch to, to venues and things like that. And I think that was a really interesting thing for me just to get started, not only just in the band leading thing, but kind of realizing that music is a business, you know, like, like, oh, in order to 
to have a big band and to do all this, you have to be so, so organized that such a big part of this is just being um, incredibly organized. Actually, I just read a really great quote from Dizzy Gillespie in his, uh, in his uh, autobiography, uh, To Be or To Bop. And he said like, band leaders can only get respect from the band in two ways. It's like, you have to be a better musician than everyone in the band. And like, we can think of like bands that maybe have that quality. Or he said, you have to be like the most organized person known to man. And then he said, everyone will respect you. You got to be one of the two. <laughs> I always yeah. thought that was really interesting. To be or to bop. So man, yeah. what year was the was the Bugaboo Big Band formed officially? 2008, nine? Yeah, I want to say 2008. Yeah. And then kind of went for about four or five years there. Man, so you were, yeah. you were how old? 18 at that point? Yeah, I think point? that's, yeah. You're crazy. Let, let's just. <laughs> <do it. laughs> We're both crazy. So, so what is the lead up to you starting the Bugaboo Big Band? Yeah, I think it really started when I had started interest writing a little bit, and I knew I wanted to, you know, kind of delve into a couple of people's libraries and start playing some charts that I hadn't played before. So we were going into, you know, Ellington stuff. We were going into um, a lot of Thad charts, and I just wanted to have it sort of just start as an informal reading thing. But the cats, everybody had such a great time and it created such a hang um, that I started booking some shows. And so it really kind of went from there. You know, you start it and then everyone gets so excited. And then once we had a show, we had a nice write up in um, in uh, Jazz Weekly, actually, the very first show. And like that was like, oh, OK, like we can actually do this. We, we, we sold out the club and now we can kind of do it again and again. And uh, I guess I'm 33 now and I'm still doing it. Man, I, I mean, it's, I just think it's so fascinating, you know, the the organization of, of it all. Um, what I want to talk about is two things, and I can't decide which to talk about first, so I'm going to let you decide. But I want to talk about sure. sort of like the, you know, if we go a little bit deeper into the into the boredom that you mentioned, and that being the reason why you started the big band, I, I want to talk a little bit more about like the passion and um, and sort of like what made you really know that you know, I'm Danny John Acucci and I'm a big band leader. And then I want to know how the big band, the Bugaboo big band helps lead us from, from where you were when you were 18 years old into the band that you lead today, the Danny John Acucci big band that has two or three records out. Now two records, I think out and one on the way, <laughs> two on the or one out and two on the way. <laughs> it's um, a lot. Yeah, you know, you're, yeah, you, were, you were 18 years old when you started. So I think you can really shed some light for a lot of our, our younger group members here in terms of like how to start a band when you're, when you're that age, like what to look out for, what to do, what not to do. Um, so I want to kind of open up that conversation and just kind of talk about how to go from having that passion, being a trumpet player, playing in big bands at school, playing in big bands around town, to saying, no, I want to do it and then doing it. Yeah. So let's start yeah, there. That's, that's a great question. Yeah. It really started for me, like a love of the music, you know, you, you want every opportunity that you can, you can find when to play this music. And sometimes when opportunities aren't there, you have to make your own. I think that that's a big thing for young musicians now, um, as we've seen, you know, even post pandemic that in, in light of everything going on in the world, there's just less opportunities for big bands. I think a lot of the time when we hear about our elders, you know, they were going on the road for a couple months on end when they were, you know, just out of school and things like that. They had so many opportunities because big bands were truly everywhere. I mean, like you think about like every ho hotel that had a big band and every city that had touring big bands and there were a lot of opportunities. So I think now if you're really passionate about this music and unless there's some, you know, opportunity outside of school, you really have to kind of create it. And so finding like-minded people becomes your next best thing. You know, you, you have the internet, you have all these ways you can find people, find like-minded people and hit them up and say, hey, if we uh, got together on this date, played some charts, uh, you know, did, did some things, maybe we'd try to book a show, you know, are you interested? And you, you, you really quickly find people that are uh, equally passionate about it. So for me, it really snowballed. I saw the positive energy. I saw that the community was being built. I saw the connections that were being made between all these like, oh, you know this person because you go to this college in school and you know now you get to meet this person. That's how we met. And I think that those kind of connections really have such a big opportunity with a big band. Um, 
I remember we, we were meeting other people that were doing the same thing, like the Fathom brothers who had their big band at the time. And I remember they came through Southern California and, uh, and it was really great to meet them. So you got, we, we got to meet so many different people at an early start. And so I just say, just, just make it happen. So we're going to make our way through till, till now, you know, what, what, what basically got you from Bugaboo Big Band till, to today. But while we're on the topic um, of writing music, what, what kind of got you started in terms of actually writing for Big Band? You know, did yeah. you start with small group? Did you start with septet, sextet, and then just go to Big Band? How did we, how did we decide that, that, that four musicians weren't enough, that we needed the full 17? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I so I was actually played I played in like kind of like a jazz and, and pop group when I was in early high school. It was actually called the Blues Boys. And this was in the Conejo Valley in, in Southern California. And the Blues Boys was basically a small big band. It was three trumpets, two trombones, I can't remember three or four saxes and a four piece rhythm section plus a vocalist. And this band, we did gigs like every weekend. We we you know, for being kids basically, we were working quite a bit. And um, we had weekly rehearsals and um, not a lot of charts obviously were available for that like kind of unique size, small big band. So that's actually when I started writing my first few little sketches and charts was for this size band. Um, either they were kind of rearrangements of other songs that we could do with this or they were original compositions. And so I'd already had a little bit of experience in high school, but I definitely didn't have a lot of like direction with it. And it wasn't until I started, you know, going to college where you start learning more about theory and then you start getting a lot of the theoretical, you know, uh, techniques of arranging and orchestrating. But really, I was just writing what I heard. I sat down at the piano. I played through some chords. I tried to ask people. And that was a really big part of it, just asking people, just saying, hey, can you play this? What would this sound like to play? And then, you know, someone would say, you know, that's really too high or that's really too low or, uh, you know, you have way too many double sharps here, you know, things like that. Uh, that was really how it started just kind of a, as a need of like putting stuff together for this band. And then when I was in college, I was really interested in writing for a number of different groups. Like the, uh, I've led a group called the Danny John Cucci experiment, which, uh, featured, uh, a lot of great friends and Steven. I remember we, we, we did some shows with that band, which were super fun. So this was kind of like electric driven music, a lot of synthesizers and effects. And that was a really fun group, small group to write for. So I was really interested at that time, but I didn't really start getting into larger, larger stuff until I had an accident when I was in college. Um, I unfortunately was um, assaulted um, and, uh, on the streets in Philly and a guy hit me in the mouth and um, that injury basically made it so I couldn't play trumpet for my whole senior year of college. You know, it was this important time, a big time of transition, um, and not being able to play was, was really soul crushing. You know, it's like, oh shoot, this is everything I've trained for. It's everything I've done. I have the music in me, but now I can't express myself on my instrument. So I really, really pivoted in that year, uh, to spending all my time writing. Cause that's all I could do. I was playing a little bit of trombone <laughs> to try to get my chops back and get my lips buzzing, but, but they were, you know, there was scar tissue there. So they weren't buzzing for many, many months. And, um, that's when I started writing for strings more and I started writing for big band. And then I decided, you know what, I should actually really pursue this and start taking some lessons. So that was kind of the progression from there. What was the first uh, teacher that you had uh, in terms of taking lessons? Yeah. The first person I started taking lessons with for big band writing was Norman David at Temple university. And he teaches the arranging classes there uh, along with Bruce Barth. And uh, yeah, they definitely gave me gave me my first little introductions to big band, how to voice for the brass, how to voice for the saxophones. And then I just, you know, kind of started getting these like little rehearsals together. And then I remember when we moved to New York, that was kind of the thing. Everyone was just down to do rehearsal sessions where, hey, everybody just brings their charts and let's hear how they sound. And I think that that's when the real learning started happening. When, when I started to hear really, really high caliber musicians play the things that uh, that I wrote and I and hearing you know other people's like hearing your music played for the first time and hearing what everyone else is and then I think that that's really where like the learning dramatically increases having the frequency of hearing live music played yeah loud music played it's uh yeah 
Yeah. And man, do you remember what some of the, the first early questions that you were asking your, your teachers were Norman and, and, and Bruce, what were like the first questions that you were asking them in those early big band lessons? Yeah, I guess I was mostly, um, I wanted to understand how the sections talked to each other. You know, we have these different groups. We have the trumpets, we have the trombones, and we have the saxes. And sometimes when you look at how many horns that is, it's just overwhelming. It's like, what do I do with nine horns? It's, it's crazy. What, what could I possibly write? You know, we only have so many notes. And so I really wanted to understand, you know, what, what the trumpets sound like in unison, what the trumpets sound like in thirds, what they sound like in fourths, what they sound like in four-part harmony, and then how that can relate to the saxophones. So I remember one of the big things I really was focusing on was creating contrast between if a brass section was in harmony, then the saxes would be in unison. Or when the uh, saxophones were playing in five-part harmony, the brass sections would be responding in unison to create that contrast. And then I started to say, oh, okay, I understand. Because I knew four-part harmony. I knew how to write basic piano voicings. But then it was like, oh, this is how you orchestrate and combine them to create different colors and textures. That was my first question. So how long did you have to take off from, from trumpet after the, the incident? Yeah, it was, a, it was about a year. I would say it was, it was about a year. So it was enough time that I wrote like a suite for strings. I wrote uh, my first couple big band charts that I was somewhat proud of. I had written some earlier, but these were the first ones that I was like pretty happy with. Um, and I spent a lot, a lot of time listening and, and really focusing and developing and, and kind of analyzing big band charts just from a uh, listening process to learn from. Man, a year is a long time. I'm really, you know, I, I know this, you've told me in the past, but even still, I'm sorry that that is something that happened to you. Um, would you say that that year of not playing the trumpet and only focusing on writing, um, was that like one of the transformative years that you had in terms of getting better at your craft? I definitely think so. It's like, you know, looking back, I'm kind of thankful it happened. It was humbling in a weird way. You know, it really taught me that music and life is, is so fragile, you know, that we, we do these things and we're so passionate about them. We train and we train and we train, but life gets in the way sometimes and you really have to appreciate every moment. So I remember, when I got back on the trumpet and I started playing gigs again, like I just knew from that day, I was like, I'm never going to take this for granted. And I think that everyone has kind of been through that now with, with COVID. Uh, I think after the pandemic, you know, every, every, I remember going out to like the first few gigs and just everyone was so happy to play again. And that was the feeling I had when I was, this happened when I was 21. So I really got Damn. through that already. Yeah. Wow. That, that's crazy, man. 21 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, in terms of, in ter I mean, dude, and you, and you pivoted in such a, in such a bold way too. I mean, it's hard to, to make that transition and try and become a arranger, orchestrator, composer, band leader, you know, big band band leader at that. So can you talk a little bit about, about that in terms of, you know, you brought up moving to New York, I guess, 21 years old to your what junior senior year of college. Yeah. And then you moved mm -hmm. to New York in 2000 and 14 2013 or 14 12 i think yeah right 12. after i moved right after yeah wow wow wow. Yeah. okay so what's your what is your entry into new york like and how do you bring the bugaboo big band into new york what's what's, <laughs> what's that story yeah so i had still done a couple band leading gigs in philly and la during my college years and then after college i decided i was going to give it a go in new york um, our mutual friend, Jamie Eblen, drummer, who introduced us, uh, he needed a roommate in Brooklyn. And I said, all right, I'll take it. At this point, you know, I was just recovering as a trumpet player. So I didn't have any gigs in Philly. I think that that was a really big part of it for me. It was that I wasn't tied to anything because I didn't have a lot of people, you know, you know it's like, oh, it's so hard to move to a new city because I have such a great thing going on. It was really easy for me because I wasn't really working. And I said, okay, well, I can move to New York and kind of get my start there. And I was really thankful that I did because in that first year I met, I mean, we had, we had known each other, but you know, then you introduced me to, to Charlie Rosen and uh, John Lake. We all met like within like the first year of moving here. And it was really like, I, I, I knew I was in the right place as, as, as soon as I started meeting people that I really enjoyed learning from and being around playing with. 
So how did you start getting your first gigs in New York? And were you focused primarily on getting gigs as a trumpet player? Were you focused primarily on getting gigs as a band leader? Were you focusing on trying to get work as an arranger orchestrator? What was your what was your process like on that front? Yeah, that's a good question. It It's really, um, I remember it really vividly. I, I, I moved to New York and I was like, I need to make money. <laughs> New York is so expensive. And I think that's the hardest struggle for anyone to move to New York. You realize that, you know, this, the city itself is just extremely difficult to make it. There's so many musicians. There's not as many gigs to go around for as many people there are. The gigs pay less. Rent is higher. It is really this difficult, difficult city to make it. So when I moved here, I remember John Riley, a uh, great drummer for the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, he said, uh, you've got to establish yourself when you move to a new city, just that you are a working musician, that you are here to play and gig and that you are professional and you've got kind of everything together. And I really came in with that mindset that I wanted to come here, not just to play sessions, not to just to do some stuff for free, but I really wanted to work. And I remember, you know, a lot of trumpet players throwing me some gigs early on and like getting to know those trumpet players that could really help me out. A lot of older trumpet players that would say, Hey, I can't make it to this big band. Can you go play for me? Can you go play this gig? And I think that that was a really great introduction, just knowing people on your instrument and being cool and going to their gigs and hanging and learning from them and then asking those right questions. But I remember also in that first year that I was going to the Vanguard, like every Monday to, to hear the band, uh and i remember like we would go a lot and we would always just like hang with dick oates and yeah we went all the time man we went all the time we went all the freaking time yeah every monday and i remember you and i would like have yeah we would have conversations about the music we would listen to jim mcneely's charts we would listen to extra credit and then we would like talk about it or we would listen to like dad's solis or shout sections i remember like we would sit in the back and we would like whisper to each other like oh man did you hear that like yeah like let's check that out such a crazy time yeah, we, but but that was like that was the education was like hearing this music live and and really experiencing the writing. Totally, man. So you mentioned John Riley as a mentor. Who were some of your other mentors when you moved to the city? Yeah, well, I think still a lot of my mentors from Philly remain uh, really great mentors. So Terrell Stafford, who's the director at Temple University and trumpet player in the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, hugely influential and extremely helpful. Same with uh, Nick Marchione and Scott Wentholt, who I still play with. And uh, all of all of those trumpet players are actually gonna be featured on my next next big band record. So a small plug there, but the next next one, you heard it here first, is gonna feature Terrell Stafford, Scott Wentholt, and Nick Marchion. So very, very excited about that. But yeah, they, Dick Oates, uh, Luis Bonilla, they were all extremely, extremely helpful in just like, helping shape my early years in New York and introducing me to people. They were going to, they texted me and invited me to shows. Hey, I've got you on the guest list. Come meet so-and-so, come meet so-and-so. Hey, you should work with this person. And really that was, that meant the world to me that they were looking out for me. Totally, man. That That's invaluable. And what a great team. So I'm looking forward to hearing that record now even more. In terms of writing, yeah. could you talk about like any mentors that you had in, in the writing uh, sphere? When yeah, you moved to New York. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think we had like uh, a first great mentor, both of us together when we were um, taking lessons with uh, the great David Berger. Um, I know that like he was really influential in me in my early big band years in New York, just taking charts to him. And I was taking a lot of my vocal charts to him and and asking a lot of really great, great questions. And, and he was really insightful into how how to create this music and do it right. Um, he definitely had a lot, a lot to say, and I took it all to heart. And I, it was a lot of like going back to the drawing board. I remember he would look at a chart and, and just say like, you need to rework this. And I think for, for me, that was like a, such a big thing. And you know this about me, but I always edit my charts. Like I'm constantly rewriting them and reprinting them and retaping them. Um, some charts that I've written that you've played on, like I've written like 15 times over, like I'll literally redo it. And then I learn a new voicing technique and then I'll rewrite a chart and then I'll be like, okay, th th that didn't work. Or I'll play it live and then it something didn't go right. And then I'll, I'll change a rhythm or I'll change something. So that was, that was a really great lesson. Just the flexibility to rewrite. Well, man, we'll come back to the topic of mentorship, but let's talk a little bit yeah. about editing. Let's get a little granular here for all the big band sure. nerds in the audience raise mm. his own hand. 
So talk to us a little <laughs> bit about the editing process and, and yeah. why you feel it's useful, what kinds of things you usually do. I'm sure it's different every time, but what you're looking for when you say, you know what, I hear something, I see something that I want to change. How do you go about actually doing that in your writing process? Yeah. So I was always recording everything, you know, if, if it was a rehearsal or if it was a gig, I was always trying to record everything so I could listen back. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a tough thing. It's like one of these really tough things as that you have to learn as a writer when something doesn't go right, is it my fault as a writer or is it the player's fault as a player? You know, is it oh, okay? They just missed a note or they didn't come in right. Or is it my fault? And I think that you have to really be self-aware enough to listen back to your recordings and then be like, okay, it didn't go right that first night, but now on the next rehearsal, let's see. And it's a different section. It's different people. Wow. They made the same mistake. Hmm. Maybe it's not them. Maybe it's me. And then for me, that was like a really big part of it, it was like, oh, okay. Now I can see like, this is awkward. It doesn't really lay well on the saxophone and, oh, it's kind of high for the tenor or you know, you, you ask those questions. Um, and then, you know, going back to the drawing board, go back into Sibelius, go back to the finale, what have you, you know, rewrite it. Sometimes I take screenshots, I'll send it to someone, hey, is this a little bit easier? Is this a little harder? Um, tell, tell me what you think. And then when you bring it back and then you hear it for the next time, you can kind of assess and reassess and say, okay, that went, that went better. Or like, wow, that was a total crash and burn. But that's, that's that's jazz that's that's important that's important to crash and burn i think that uh you've heard many of my charts that have crashed and burned and like that's that's like a part of it is is the learning thing you got to write you got to be bold you got to be willing to make mistakes and things like that um so the editing process becomes extremely important because then you want to you want to build on that and uh kind of polish up your charts So what kinds of things are you really listening for or looking for? You know, you mentioned, okay, there's five saxes in this section, five saxes in this section. They both made the same mistake. Okay. So you hear something and then you go back to your score and you say, all right, let's go, Danny. Let's see what I've got to do here to make this speak the way I want it to. What is yeah. your process of editing? Like, let's get that granular. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. So it really, de it depends on the, the specifics, but like, for instance, like if a sax player plays a wrong note, you know, I'm wondering like, why did they play that wrong note? Was it a copyist thing? Did I put like an, an E sharp in there? And then I'll, I'll, I'll read the part. I'll try to like play it down. I'll try to sight sing it. I'll try to sight read it, you know? And then it's like, okay, no, maybe it looks right, but does it sound wrong? You know, like that's something too. It's like, sometimes a lot of cats will just play more or less their sight reading, but they're also using their musical intuition. And a lot of times people do that with rhythms, you know, when they're just like, they're, they're reading the rhythms, but they're also just like feeling it. And I've noticed sometimes like I'll write a rhythm and then everybody plays it wrong because it goes against what their, like their musical intuition tells them. And then, so then it's like, Oh, everybody came in on beat two, but it was on beat three or whatever. And then I'll change it. I'll move it over a beat to where everyone kind of felt it. And it's like, oh, yeah, because it makes more musical sense. You know, it, that was just like a weird rhythmic writing thing on my part that everyone else kind of felt instinctively. And then it just it just required a one beat over. But as far as like voicings and things like that, sometimes, you know, just printing out two versions, you know, just saying like taxes, can you read, read this one and read this one? I just want to hear these different voicings things. So like I want to hear the saxes where the very sax is, is doubling the lead out to the octave now i want to do five saxes and I, I you've done this with your videos and things like that and i think that's so great like giving examples giving um context for all these things because you have to hear it you have to know the difference with your ear um that's the most important thing is to be able to hear it and then make the adjustments that's awesome man so what would you say to somebody who's you know kind of in your position like you you have such a great story I mean, some parts of it are, are painful for sure, but you know, you're a story of, okay, just being a passionate trumpet player, big band leader, started his own big band at age 18, got, so, you know, got, got, got some chop issues at, at, at 21 and, um, and then made the most of it. And still, you know, those, the one thing that I would want to just 
say really quick is that those crash and burns are common. They they happen, you know, to everybody. It's not it's not just guys, it's not just happening to Danny. It happens. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't even just happen at a rehearsal. Sometimes it can happen at a gig. So Danny, what would you say to somebody who's kind of in that position where they've just experienced a massive crash and burn? How do you how would you how do you how would you help them? What would you say to help that person? Yeah, I would say it totally happens and that we're our own worst critics. You know, when a comedian crashes and burns, that's that's one thing. And most comedians will say that they have totally bombed, like completely bombed. And that's like a part of it. You know, I think as musicians, we, we usually think it's worse than it is. You know, I'll, I'll go home and I'll say, oh, I can't believe that this didn't happen or this musical thing, this idea that I wrote, I just didn't, I didn't do it or the band didn't do it right. And you beat yourself up, but really like, as audience members, they generally don't hear the specifics of those things. They hear the overall sound, they hear the overall effort. A lot of these little things as that we hear as, as arrangers and orchestrators and as composers, these things are, are really something that we have to be self-aware of, but don't beat yourself up over it because it's really natural to, to, to have to learn from these things, especially in the beginning. Um, I think uh, I, John Lake has like this really great quote. He says like, everybody should just write 10 big band charts and then throw them away. <laughs> like, like not actually, like don't actually throw them away, but I get his point. It's like the first 10 is like, you're really learning about this. And then after that 10, it's like, okay, now we can really start getting into something that we're, we're working with. We're really cooking with grease. And I think that that was definitely true for me. I had to write a bunch of charts and then hear them and then they crash and burn. And then I had to say, okay, what do I have to do to fix this? You know, what, what is wrong with this and what, what can we learn? What was the biggest thing you learned from your first 10 big band charts? Hmm. Good question. Okay. So the first things I learned were about like mo mostly rhythmic, I would say, I think voicings and theory, these things came natural to me. Um, I didn't struggle learning about extended harmony. I didn't struggle, but rhythmic aspects not of as a player but but as a writer understanding dialogue how to play off different things between sections like understanding how how to let rhythm communicate with each other within the sections that was something i really had to focus on because in a lot of my early charts i had a lot of flams where you know the brass would come in on you know, the and of four, but then the saxes would come in on beat one and it would create these weird rubs. And a lot of times those rubs created a lot of uh, lack of clarity in the charts, I would say. This, they, they got really muddy or I would write too low for all of the instruments and then the voicings were just too muddy. That's something that you have to really hear uh, played live to in order to like really understand, just get the feeling of, I think um, I've kind of said this before, but like I, I listened with, I have no performer and I have Sibelius and like, these are great, great tools, but, um, but they're not always super accurate of how things are gonna sound. Now, I would say after years of doing this and, and you know you know how this is, you can listen to something in Sibelius and you can say, yeah, this is gonna be swinging. Like the cats are gonna kill this, it sounds great. But at the beginning, it's, it's harder to distinguish um, what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Hmm. Do you still find yourself trying to distinguish ahead of time or do you sort of think you know you know, there's always questions. Like right now, I'm working on a couple uh, arrangements for a, a orchestra in Germany right now, and I'm writing some string arrangements. And um, you know, there's some bassoon solos and some English horn solos. And sometimes I wonder, like, you know, am I going to cover them up? I'm going to cover up an oboe solo with the strings and things like that, um, just because I have less experience hearing my orchestral stuff played live. Um, a lot of the time I will get the opportunity to lucky chance to write for an orchestra. I usually, you know, send it out and they play it and perform it. And I always say, please send me a recording. And sometimes they don't. So those are some questions that I still have to answer for myself, um, just about balance and blend and making sure that the parts registrally are allowing each instrument to be heard at their best. So you mentioned writing for an orchestra in Germany. How do you go from being a trumpet player to leading a big band to starting from scratch in a new city to starting another big band 
or really two big bands because we can talk about new alchemy too if you want to yeah and then becoming an international arranger and orchestrator what is that journey like what can you say what can you say about that journey yeah yeah it it it, it really has snowballed recently and i think a lot of it has to do with putting out your own music. I think back in the day, there were a lot of opportunities for arrangers to, you know, get on a gig, start writing for stuff. As I said, like a lot of times musicians were like already in a touring band and they would just need charts and there were so many arrangers, but now, um, and you can tell me if this is, if you agree with this, but like, I think that I put out my first full big band record this last year and that was Voices and it featured 11 vocalists but I've definitely gotten a lot more interest in charts once I put that out. So I like to say that CDs or albums are like really expensive business cards, uh, especially as an arranger, that people aren't really gonna have an interest in you unless they've already heard your stuff. Um, so that that has really happened for me. And then the orchestral stuff has kind of come in every which way I, I studied. Another great mentor was Michael, uh, Michael Philip Mossman, who I studied with uh, at Queens College during the pandemic, I actually went back and got my master's degree and studied with uh, Mike Mossman. And he writes for uh, a number of different groups in ensembles and movies and orchestras. And he really showed me a lot about the orchestra and taught me how to write for different groups. So I've gotten some opportunities to do that. And it's really a pleasure. So Awesome, man. So let's talk about Voices. This yeah. came out a couple months ago. Right. When did it come out exactly? It came out in August. Yeah. August. Yeah. Wow. Time is flying. Holy crap. <laughs> it, um, really, it's already, it's already March. So man, I, I mean, I, I dig all your writing, but one of the things that I love most about your writing, if I may say so myself, is the way that you write vocal big band features. How did you arrive at this amazing skill at this amazing niche? Um, because I, I do believe that this is something that, that a lot of people in New York city, they, they know you for, they know if they want to get a killer big band chart for, for jazz voice, Danny John Acucci is one of the go-to composers, arrangers and orchestrators to hit up. So what did you do to really get that craft together? Not necessarily the business side of things, but like the craft of writing, vocal big band yeah. charts like what what went into that for you, you mentioned david berger before and bringing in your vocal charts uh to your lessons with him um and you know i know that you, you you're you're writing for new alchemy featuring different vocalists over the course of a couple of years at the django um you've had a lot of experience so i know that this is something that that's going to resonate for me and i'm sure for a lot of other people listening as well yeah yeah, as you mentioned, that, that Django gig was really important. That was a monthly gig in New York City uh, for Big Ben, and that was split between four arrangers and writers, and we all had the opportunity to, you know, pick different special guests, whether they were instrumentalists or a lot of times vocalists. So I've always kind of had a love for vocal jazz. Um, I think that that's where it started, that um, I do sing a little bit, and I, I just enjoy vocal music. I love Big Ben with vocals, so I've always had it in my ear. Um, and so I knew that I would want to write, write for these styles. So for me, the, it was like a gradual, like, I love, I love doing this. And now it's just like, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is just, it, it, it and it had to be, I, I knew I wanted to do it. So I started doing it. I can't say it, it started easily. I think that writing for vocals is one of the most difficult, difficult things. And I'm not talking about like vocal groups. I'm saying like a featured vocalist with a jazz band it is really, really tricky. And it's something that we as instrumentalists don't always learn much about the voice. We don't always learn about, um, you know, how the voice works, how the voice projects. And so we, we don't really learn about the strengths and weaknesses of different singers. Um, I've really been fortunate to work and tour with a lot of vocalists over the years, you know, in small groups and things like that. And I, I ask a million questions. I say like, you know, tell me about your, your break and where you switch from your chest voice, to your head voice, and tell me how, um, how it feels when, when this is happening behind you, whereas this is happening behind you. Um, so for me, learning about how to get out of the vocalist way was the biggest lesson I can, I can impart is with big band, uh, arranging such a big part of vocal writing is to get out of the way. And if we want to just get into the nitty gritty, I would say, uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see when people are starting out with big band charts 
is uh, either be a student or something will send me a chart and they'll send me the chart and it won't even have the vocal melody written out. It'll, they'll say, here's the chart on whatever, whatever standard or what have you, but there's no vocal line. They're saying like, yeah, I know it. I know Honeysuckle Rose, like we all know it. So I don't need to write it out. The vocals, yeah, they know it, but that's not the kind of the important part. And the important part is writing the melody down so you, you can understand what you're playing off of um, and also being able to analyze it. I think for me, when I'm tasked with uh, arranging a chart, whether it's a standard, whether it's a pop tune, anything, I write out the melody first, even before I learn the chords, I just write out the contour of the melody and I make little notes about it and I, and I circle little things and I'll say, okay, you know, uh, da, 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 da. I'll write out the shape of that. That's such a unique in introduction, first four notes. Uh, you know, up a step, then a jump, then down a step. I'll circle that. That's motif one. Da, 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 da. All right, that's motif two. Going down and then going uh, by stepwise up. Once I've done that for the whole piece, just notes, notes and rhythms, no chords, no harmony. Then I'll start to like kind of extrapolate it. And this is something I really love to do is take each one of those motifs and put them in reverse you know, put them in the inverse, put them upside down, uh, put them with different intervals, but the same shape. Um, and I just kind of like write these in a little notebook. You know, we all have these like little writer's notebooks. Just write down each one of these little things and then say, okay, I've got like 40 different little melodic ideas that are based on, you know, the first two bars of I got it bad. And then it's not like, like, doing that and then I just plug it right into a chart. It's not like, okay, now I'm gonna plug, you know, this example 2A into the intro. It's more like we all have the writer's block, right? We're writing a chart, you're getting so good. You're like, yes, this is the best first A. This is the best second A. Oh, the bridge is great. All right, next A. Next A. And you're, you're sitting there and you're like looking at the piano and you're looking at the screen, we've all been through this where we're looking at a blank something, whether it's a blank page, a blank measure, and we don't know what to do. And this is where I go back to my little notebook. And once I'm stuck, I go, ah, oh, gosh, what do I do here? And then I, I look back at all those little examples. Oh, the melody, yeah, the melody has all the information we need. So the importance of writing down the melody is that it has all the information that we're gonna set up in the arrangement. Uh, always make sure to like, circle the high points of the melody, circle the low points. These are things just to be aware of because as a singer, obviously you have a lot more projecting, projection when you're singing high. I've, I've heard many a big band chart where the singer is singing in the lowest register and then you've got the trumpet screaming on a, on a, you know, a high G uh, above, above the treble clef and you know like the vocalist is gonna, you know, start, start cursing and saying why, yeah, I can't, I can't even get a note out. You know, no one's going to hear this lyric or hear me at all. Um, so being aware of the contour of the melody is the most important thing. Um, so for when I get a commission to write a vocal chart, you listen to a million recordings and you write out the melody and you learn it inside and out. Amazing, man. Wow. That was such a great answer. <laughs> I hope you guys were taking notes. Oh, if yeah, anyone yeah. has any questions, if anyone has any questions or, you know, feel free to, to shoot them out. Yeah, definitely. There's a couple of different questions going on in the chat right now. So, uh, you know, one question is, uh, from, from Marcio and Marcio asks, is there a mix of timbres that you like to use most for voicings or does it depend on the context of the song? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question. Uh, definitely context is king, you know, uh, I just released a new big band single the other week um, that has kind of the mutes and flutes texture, which I totally love having, you know, um, happy birthday. To Quincy. <laughs> that's right. Happy birthday. 91. It was, that's it's amazing. He's one of my all time, all time, all time heroes for oh, one of the guns. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so the, the track is called Q's a light. It's uh, definitely in the style of his soul bossa nova album. And uh, I love the texture of mutes and flutes. And so that's something as a trumpet player, I kind of have a unique understanding of because I, I played a lot of these mutes and flutes charts, you know, combining a harmon mute with a cut mute with two flutes. 
And it's a tex texture that I also explored in one of my tracks on the Voices album, also a samba. But in that track, I did four flutes and I did four trumpets at times in different various mutes, sometimes straight mute. Um, so it really depends. I think figuring out, again, going back to the melody, like what does the song need? Like a lot of the timbral things can be solved just by thinking about like, what is the mood of the song? What are the lyrics about? Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it about love? Is it about love lost? Is it about wanting love? Um, and then going from there, thinking about, you know, texturally, um, I remember like Michael Mossman gr gave this really great lesson talking about timbres and textures. And uh, he was talking about, um, he was talking about an arrangement of inner urge. I think one that hopefully we're all familiar with by um, also Stephen, your arrangement on inner urge is incredible, but I'm talking about um, the one that was done for the uh, Carnegie Hall jazz band from um, Slide Hampton. And in that arrangement, there's a really great moment where the trumpets are up really high and they're playing in a cup mute. And if any of you are trumpet players out there, you know that when you're playing really high into a cup mute, it's kind of like really difficult, especially if you're playing loud. And the effect is someone that's kind of screaming into a pillow, like, <laughs> and that, that was a great lesson that, that Mossman taught me. He was just like, think about it. What is that effect? It's the effect of an inner urge. And I thought that was, that's, that's genius, you know, like taking the idea of an inner urge and then putting it into something that comes out musically, sonically and timbrely using mutes and uh, a certain tessitura of the trumpet. So. Yeah. Now, just quickly, is that the same arrangement that was put on the Joe Henderson big band album? Yes. I did say Carnegie Hall that it was on the Joe Henderson album. Yes, that's okay, right. Got you. Man, what a great arrangement. arrangement. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and, but Slide also wrote some great stuff for the Carnegie Hall jazz band. I mean, the shiny stockings arrangement, if, and if you guys exactly. haven't heard that one, one of the, I mean, it's so cool to check out Slide's way of like through composing this arrangement all the way from start to finish. What Super a, killing. what a, what a, what a bad dude. Marcio, thanks for that question. That was great. You know, on the topic of vocal charts, Russ, Russ asks a really, a really good question. And it's sort of just like taking us in a slightly different direction. He's, see, he says, do you write out the lyrics too, even if it's an instrumental? Okay. I get the question. So, so you're talking asking about like, like the importance of lyrics in terms of yeah. like understanding the meaning of a song before you go in an arrangement, whether or not you have vocals or not. Totally. That's a really good, great question. So even if a song doesn't have a vocalist playing, I still like to know the lyrics for sure, because it's still the song, you know, it's still the tune and people will know it and, and appreciate if you pay attention to the lyrics, you know, there's, there's a lot of musical devices that we can do. Um, how strange the change from major to minor every time we say goodbye, you know, if we take a standard, but you know, if, what if we colored that differently? You know, we go major to minor, just like in those chords, but maybe we reharm it or do something different. I think knowing the lyrics is extremely important. Also, just to understand the vibe of the piece, right? Uh, if you take a song that's sad and you write like a super happy arrangement on it, there might be a little bit of a disconnect unless you're doing it intentionally, which is a total vibe. You, you can intentionally do something different. Um, an example of that is On the Street Where You Live, arranged by Stephen Feifke. I love that arrangement so much because you took the lyrics and then you turned it on its head. You said on the street where you live, that's it, Oh, it's a love song. Oh, it's so cute. But you're like, wait, what if it wasn't a love song? What if it was like a creepy song and then bup, 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 and adding these triadic trombone voicings descending, uh, lyrics can have an, an incredible impact on a song. So I would say if you want to write them out or you want to learn them, or you want to be able to just recite them, Absolutely. Super important. Totally. And first of all, thanks for those nice words about that arrangement. You know, it's, 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 so it's not 1950 <laughs> anymore. It's not so cool to go and knock on your, your, your lover's door 15, 20 times after they told you to please stop. That's what we call <laughs> nowadays in 2020 and, and above a stalker. And so that arrangement is, is my stalker take on, on the street where you live. Um, you know, but just on the topic of of melody and like the importance of lyrics. One thing that I sometimes hear, um, and this is kind of like a higher level uh, comment, but 
And so it's not just young arrangers actually, but <clears throat> when there's a when there's a consonant, a hard end to a word, sometimes I hear super super long notes in the melody, which is a choice for sure. Um, but the phrasing of the melody, that especially you know you were seeing every time we say goodbye, Cole Porter, lyricist and composer, there's an inherent connection between the melody and the lyrics, right? And so the interpretation of the melody can be informed by the lyrics. And I think that observing those vowels and consonant shapes and just the natural inflections that may take place in the lyrics is a really, really beautiful way of approaching interpreting your melodies. Danny, dude, you are you are the man. I could I could ask you so many more questions, but but we're almost out of time. And so okay. I want to ask you sort of a couple of questions that I ask everybody. Do you mind if we do a quick speed round? Let's do speed round. Let's go. Is that, is that cool with you? Let, uh, hopefully, hopefully I can I can pass the test. <laughs> okay, so it's not a speed round in the sense that all right, let's get this done in ten seconds or less. Okay. Um, it's just hopefully it's just can... a couple of it's a couple of questions. I um, mean, you can you can answer them however you want to. The first one okay. is if we go back to eighteen year old Danny just starting to write mm -hmm. big band music. What is the one thing that you wish eighteen year old Danny knew when he was writing his first big band chart? Hmm. I think more than anything, if I really had this opportunity to, to like get one message yeah. across, if you could across time, time travel space. without any consequences whatsoever, you could just go back in time and, you know, say like whisper one thing in your own ear, do this, don't do that. <laughs> what, 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 what would that be? What would that be? Uh, just just yeah, one yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, uh, I could think of a million things that would be funny, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> musically I, I related, that, big band musically related. Yeah, 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 sure. No, I, I think that I, I would just say like, like, don't stop, like, don't, don't stop, like, don't doubt it. Like, I would do something encouraging because I think that a lot, a lot of my early years was spent with a lot of like self doubt and thinking like, you know, all the cards are stacked against us. And and as jazz musicians, I really, I kind of do believe that, you know, there's so many things in our industry and our careers that make it very difficult. Um, and I was met with a lot of frustration as a young person. And I, I wish I could just go back and just be like, you got this, like you, you can do it. Just keep, don't stop. Man, incredible answer. I, I love that. Don't give up. I mean, come on, doesn't get better than don't that. Stop. No matter how tough the going gets, keep on pushing. Yep. Next question, man. What was the thing that helped you transform after those first 10 big band charts what was the one thing that helped you transform from that earlier version that earlier arranger version arranger 1.0 into danny jonacucci arranger 2.0 that we see today yeah i think it's a combination of a lot of things i think for me it was hearing all the charts live having them performed having them perform for an audience hearing the audience reaction to things there's so many things that you don't learn when you're listening in Sibelius. For instance, after a solo, everybody's clapping and everybody's making noise and you realize that like, that could take like a couple measures. And now, you know, there's clapping over this like really intricate thing that you might have written and now people just missed it. You know, little things like that. Um, I think that hearing stuff played live and also just reading a lot of books, like just understanding read about orchestration, read about all types of orchestration and listen to a bajillion recordings. That's, that's totally, the man. big difference for those. Wow. Yeah. Finding mentorship is pretty key. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And last question for you, Danny is what are you, where are you, where are you going next? What is, what is the one thing that you're working on right now? You're a professional yeah. international composer, arranger, orchestrator. What yeah, well, is it that you are working on right now in your writing? Yeah, I think that you you totally understand this lifestyle. But once you kind of make a career out of being an arranger, orchestrator as a writer, you're really just creating a career of hitting deadlines. And you're constantly set with these deadlines. And so for me right now, I've got about, gosh, uh, a couple dozen kind of commissions that are just lining up and I have deadlines for all of them. These are, you know, different artists that have asked me to do five or six big band charts of their original music. Um, I, I mentioned this, this orchestral stuff. I also have another uh, group that wants to do some more stuff for more of a pop style, big band plus strings. Um, 
a couple other great artists have asked me to do their original music. And I'm also writing this really awesome multimodal suite with an amazing uh, artist named Siren Tip. Uh, she's an incredible vocalist and producer, songwriter, and we are co-composing a jazz suite that's based off of, um, uh, it's called Mycelium. And we're gonna be debuting it this summer at the Jazz Gallery. And uh, basically it's, an, it's like a 90 minute through composed piece about um, the unseen objects in our world, like funguses and um, uh, microbacteria in the oceans. And we actually went out and we did a research trip and we, we talked with a lot of these scientists um, in the coast of Oregon, we actually went out there and we talked to scientists for like two weeks and we uh, recorded all this data and we're actually writing a whole piece based on that. So that's what's been going on. It's uh, it's a really exciting time. Awesome, Danny. So where can we hear the next album? When is that one coming out and what is it called? All right. The next album is coming out next month. It's called Past is Present. And uh, we recorded that. Steven is playing piano on the album. We recorded it about five years ago and it never came to light. So we're putting it out now. And then I have another album that will be coming out in August. So two big man albums up in the next six months. Awesome, Danny. Dude, congratulations on everything that's going on. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us talking through your writing process and your journey. You're a bad dude. I can't wait to listen to Past is Present and the Unnamed album out in August. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much, everybody, for, for who attended live. If you would like to come to the next one live, just make sure you join the Facebook group, the Big Band Arrangers and Composers Support Group. All right, everybody. Cheers. Thank All right. you. Cheers. Happy Big Band. Happy Big Band. <laughs>